David Essel, welcome to the podcast. Ah, Dr. Leeds, I've been looking forward to this. We're going to have a great time today. Definitely. So, um, yeah, tell me a, a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, how you got involved in this addiction and alcohol recovery business. Well, there's nothing better than firsthand experience, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> you know, I, I struggled as a kid. I started my addictions actually at 12, Dr. Leeds. Um, it was a way to fit in. I was an extremely sensitive kid. I'm still a very a sensitive man. Uh, but, you know, I was raised in a family that didn't know how to handle my sensitivity and I didn't know how to handle it. And so I started looking. I was always an angry child and we couldn't figure out why. Doctors were saying it was my allergies. But, you know, later on in life, as I worked with other counselors to find out what my issues were in childhood, it had nothing to do with allergies, although I did have them. But it was just that I didn't know how to express my emotions, a wide range of emotions. And so, you know, my mom and dad were phenomenal parents, but they just didn't know how to handle someone so incredibly sensitive and creative and all the different things that I've become. And so I started reaching out and trying to find acceptance, you know, validation. And I found on a beach one, one summer, these 16 year old kids, and I wanted to hang with them and I had to have a beer in order to hang with them. It was like the ritual, right? And yeah. all of a sudden I found after one beer that, oh my God, my anger was gone and it was phenomenal, you know? And so then that led me to experiment with every drug known to man. I don't think there's anything that I didn't take uh, between that 12 years of age and my mid twenties. I mean, it was just a, a free fast I, and, and, and I struggled and struggled, but I'll tell you the, the crushing blow came in 1990. Um, I had a failed suicide attempt. And the reason that happened was because I was self-medicating. And when I finally got healed from that and we started doing the deep work, we found out all these things, Dr. Leeds, that I had had since childhood, undiagnosed depression, undiagnosed anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, ADD, ADHD, all these different things that I was being diagnosed with. And so the first time I was diagnosed with some of these emotional conditions or mental conditions, you know, I pushed back. I said, there's no way I'm Mr. Motivation. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've had this title, Mr. Motivation, since I was a kid, you know, like there's no way I could ever be depressed. But as I went from one expert to the next, the same result came to being. So in 1990, I decided to dedicate my entire rest of my life to emotional regulation, which is a fancy term in therapy, meaning that we are in control of our emotional responses to the world. Um, I started going deep into the world of addiction recovery, uh, and we created a, a permanent alcohol and addiction recovery program over 30 years ago. And we've helped so many people get clean, but it's very different than what most people would consider a recovery program today. So it was, it's been a long, windy road. Um, I will never say that, you know, I wish I didn't get addicted or I wish I was never an alcoholic. Um, I don't call myself Dr. Leeds an ex-addict or a former alcoholic or any of that nonsense. It's, <clears throat> you know, I'm David Essel. That's all I am. I'm David Essel yeah. trying to make a difference in this world without any freaking labels from my past that are going to put people's um, maybe mindset in a different place or even my mindset. You know, I believe with permanent alcohol recovery, you don't ever say that you're an ex-addict, ex-alcoholic, and you're not an alcoholic for life. You know, we have so many programs teaching nonsense. I mean, stuff that they created 80 years ago that was valid 80 years ago. But, yeah. you know, this whole thing about it's a disease, nonsense. Uh, it's your genes, nonsense. It's not your fault, nonsense. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. It's no one's fault but yours. It's no one's fault but mine. When we are in an addictive process, we know we're in an addictive process. Now at 12, I may not have been able to emotionally separate myself and say, okay, this is going to be bad. This is going to be a 30 year addiction. This is going to be a lot, you know, at 12, I had no ability to think. But as we age, we need to be able to look in the mirror and say, this isn't my parents fault. This isn't genetics yeah. that opens that bottle of wine or that can of beer or puts that needle in my arm or whatever. You know, it, Dr. Leeds, it's simply called a choice. Yeah, and it, it makes sense. Um, you know, in the end, I mean, people, uh, I think they think there's a safety net there for them. And, you know, they go to meetings and it gives them a, fence, a sense of uh, security. You know, these people are going to welcome me back every time I mess up. And in the end, there's really there's really no safety net. It's either you do it or you don't do it. A hundred percent. And, you know, my greatest concern is, is that, you know, these organizations have been teaching this stuff for so long and we've had no counter voice. 
you know, we've had we've had no one saying it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, their success rate is 10 percent. The average person yeah. that goes into a meet a room for meetings, only 10 percent of them will be sober in 12 months. 90% will have relapsed once, twice, 20, 50, 100 times. And there, there's, there's, there's nothing of, of why we wouldn't relapse. I mean, people keep saying, you know, it's okay. It's a disease. It's not your fault. Are you kidding me? You know, so people relapse and they're welcome back in with open arms. Now, part of that is fine. With my client base, if I have a client that relapses and it happens from time to time, not a lot, but it does happen. Oh, my God. I don't say a thing other than we're moving on. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to find out what was the emotional reason you relapsed because everything is tied into emotion, you know, boredom, anger, resentment, uh, victimhood, grief, trauma, PTSD. I mean, every addiction is based in some type of trauma, um, a, a lack of, of parental attention between the ages of zero and eight. Oh, my God. You know, it's like that is a setup for addiction. And then we go from eight to 16, another setup for addiction. If we don't have really good role models. Now, this sounds like I'm blaming parents, but I, I'm, I'm going to end this with on a positive note. Yes, the parents have a role until we turn 18, in turn when we turn 21. And as an adult, now it's our responsibility. If we didn't get the nurturing from mom and dad and we found it in friends that used, we found it in substances, we found it in food. Oh, my God. The, largest drugs in the world are food. Our yeah. food manufacturers have got us nailed. They know that sugar, fat, white flour, and salt hit the same pleasure center of the brain that dopamine hits, for God's sake. They yeah. have set up America and the world to be obese. You know, yeah. three, three years ago, Dr. Leeds, and you probably know all these statistics I'm going to throw out there. I know you do. But, you know, three years ago, we had about 75 percent of Americans overweight or obese. The last statistics I saw was 85 percent. That's a massive increase in three years of overweight and obesity. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's the food company's fault because they're just massive marketers. And, you know, they use neuroscience to make their cookies for God's sake, just like cigarette <laughs> companies do. You know, yeah. they use uh, MRI imaging of the brain to see what hits the most, you know, when they're adding sugar, salt, or something to the nicotine. I mean, these people are massive marketers and they know how to make us feel that we need their product. So not only do they put the product and the ingredients in a way to light up that pleasure center of the brain to get us addicted, but then they tell us we need more and we need more, you know, so we have to be very independent, Dr. Leeds, when we're talking about addiction, because it goes into sex, it goes into spending, it goes into hoarding, you know, it goes, goes everywhere, right? But we have to be very realistic, which is why I'm so glad and I'm so honored that you are having me on the show, because there's a lot of programs, there's a lot of individuals that still believe in this old nonsense, keep coming back, keep coming back. You know, if you keep yeah. coming back, you'll stay clean. Well, that's called codependency. Yeah. Can you imagine if I said to my clients, hey, as long as you keep working with me for the rest of your life, you'll be OK. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. like, no, I, you know, we empower our clients, Dr. Leeds, where we give them, we make sure now they can leave a program at any time. But those that stay with a full two or three month program, some I'm with a year and a half or two years even. But when they leave. I don't want them coming back for addiction. I want them coming back for their relationships. I want them coming back for financial help. I want, but I don't, I want to empower them and give them the tools that they don't need David Essel for the rest of their freaking life. You know, that's codependency, but these yeah. groups are built on codependency. And I want to tell you something. When I got sober a very, very long time ago, I made a promise. I had to go to a recovery center. I went to a treatment center for 30 days. I have no shame about saying that. It's what was needed at the time. And I highly recommend if that's what you need, freaking do it. And then I came out and I hired a counselor for 365 days. Once a week, 52 weeks, I worked with them all the time. And in that process, I understood one thing, that one day at a time philosophy is the biggest piece of crap ever. If you're going to commit one day at a time, you are not committing to crap. Now, here's an example I love to give. Listen to this, Dr. Leeds. Imagine yeah. this. You're in love with someone and you get engaged and you're a guy and you turn to your partner and say, honey, I love you so much. We're engaged now. I want to marry you. And let's say that she's online. Oh, my God, I think this is great. And she's crying and everything. He goes, 
but there's only one thing we're going to do a little differently, baby. And she says, what's that? We're going to get married one day at a time. <laughs> do you think yeah. Dr. Leeds, that woman would be excited to know that the marriage <laughs> is good for one day and then they have to do it again tomorrow and they have to do it again tomorrow. Well, that's the setup that we're talking about. You yeah. know, there's no independence. It's all codependent. So, you know, we, we love the fact that there are people like you that are allowing these messages that are counterculture, all 100% counterculture, but they work. And we've got to get out of this stuff. And the other analogy I give, these groups that have been around for 80 years, you know, they have never updated their programs. We've learned so much about the mind. We've learned so much about, it's not a disease. It's not your genes that forces a beer down your throat. We've learned so much, right? But they still teach the same nonsense. And the question I ask is this, they have a 90% failure rate. Why yeah. are we going to a program and promoting a program and all the fitness or all the uh, recovery centers in America pretty much still run off of 12 steps at some level? Why are we promoting yeah. a program with a 90% failure rate is my first question. Secondly, what other business in this world is operating out of the same principles 80 years ago and successful? And I'll tell you the answer, zero. There's not one company that started 80 years ago that's decided to not use computers yeah. and they're selling cars out of cabinets with phones. And they're saying, well, let me call around and see if I can find the car you're looking for. Hell no, that, that car business would be out of business in a heartbeat, right? They had to keep up with the times. They had to have I'll go online and websites and make changes to the way they market and sell. But these other organizations are stuck 80 years ago. And that's why we yeah. have such a terrible success rate of, of, of addiction recovery in this country and the world, actually. Yeah. Well, maybe an example of a business that's been around for a really long time and doesn't change their book at all would be the church. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you, Thank you, know, you. If you, you know, if you look at these organizations, I, I looked it up once, um, the 12 step, the big 12 step organizations, their tax structure is the same as a church. Um, so essentially, I mean, they say, you know, we're spiritual, not religious, but you know, they've put, put their, uh, their rules, their code into, into book form and it doesn't change or doesn't change much, you know, in many, most cases, I, I think NA updates their book a little bit every so many years, but it, the, the main part of it doesn't change. No, you know, and, and it hasn't changed. And, um, and I don't know why it hasn't. I, I'm perplexed. Actually, I have no clue of how a program with a 90% failure rate would think that they're doing grid work. I, I just can't even grasp that. I mean, if yeah. we had with my, you know, I've been doing this work for 43 years, Dr. Leeds. If we had a 90% failure rate, I could not last 43 years. I, I, could, I just couldn't be in yeah. business that long, right? So they're in business uh, somehow. I don't know how. Um, now, the 10% who are with us right now that believe fully in a 12-step program, and they have never cross-addicted, and they, they aren't dry drunks, you know, they, they aren't irritable, they aren't impatient, they aren't angry, they aren't cynical, because those are all the traits of the dry drunk. So you can go to meetings 365 days a year and be a dick. You can go to meetings 365 years and be an idiot. It doesn't, listen, I've got a great story. A number of years ago, I got a call from this woman who said, I'm sending my husband into you for work with recovery. And I said, okay, great. And she goes, and he doesn't want to go. I go, well, then maybe he shouldn't come in. She said, it's the only way he's going to stay married to me. He's got to go through your program. I said, okay. And so he comes in. First thing he says is, is that I don't need to be here. I said, well, it sounds like you do if you want to save your marriage. Well, that's the only reason I'm here. I'm not here to do any work. I've been sober 17 years. I said, oh, interesting, sober 17 years. So what's the problem with your marriage? And then all of a sudden, you know, my wife's this, my wife's that, my kids are that. I mean, he was the angriest person I ever saw. So I said to him, I, I give my clients homework. Everyone does homework. You know what? You don't want to do homework. You're not going to work with me. You know, this, the old therapy world where you come in and talk for 50 minutes and great job, David, I'll see you in a week is a bunch of crap. That's the same thing as 12 step. It's, yeah. it's outdated. You know, you, you've got to give your clients assignments. You see them once a week for a freaking hour. They're not going to change. 
if you don't give them work to do in between sessions, right? So, you know, we've got to see that like in therapy, we have to change. And for all therapists and counselors that are listening right now, even you coaches, you know, if, if you really want to stay up with the times, you've got to be giving incredible assignments so that they progress. But, you know, if we had a 90% failure rate, my Lord, I, I don't know what I would do other than probably be working in some other field. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was wondering, though, there's a um, there's a motivational speaker and author I, I was thinking about while you're talking, um, Grant Cardone. You know, he's one of these big authors. And, you know, he he talks about a history of addiction. He had a personal issue with addiction and and he never really comes out and says, you know, I don't I don't think he does it. This is a, I, I actually I think he does. He says his solution to addiction was it almost replacing his drug addiction with work addiction. Fill right. your calendar. Uh, make sure you're doing enough stuff all the time so you don't have time to think about drugs or addiction. What do you think about that? Of, of Is work addiction or, I mean, you, you mentioned that addiction expresses itself in different ways. You, know, you quit drugs, you start eating. Um, do you think that this replacing drug addiction with work addiction is, is a viable solution? I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm so glad you brought it up. It's the biggest bunch of crap in the world. You're going to go back into addiction. Well, first of all, you already are. You're in a new addiction called workaholism. So you've just, yeah. what you've done is you've cross addicted. Now I cross addicted and, and, and I, again, no shame, no guilt on my part. I love sharing these stories because I want people to know that I'm normal. <laughs> um, you know, I, when I quit cocaine and alcohol, uh, cocaine was an absolute miracle. How that was, that was taken away by God. It, that's all I can say. Um, alcohol, I had to work really hard, but here's the interesting thing, Dr. Leeds, when I got rid of alcohol, God, and here I am an addiction counselor, I cross addicted immediately to sugar. And so what I would do is I would go and get a cake every night at a, at a local store and I would cut it in half and I'd eat about half a cake every night. Now, sugar goes to the same pleasure center that the opiates do, that the alcohol does and everything else. So it was numbing my emotions. The most powerful effect that sugar has on the brain is that it numbs emotions. Now, as a child, the way the brain works with sugar, it's often hyperactivity. But as an adult, it often shifts into the exact opposite. We get this incredible relaxation effect, especially if you eat in the evening, you know, which is what I would do. Nine o'clock at night, eight o'clock, instead of having my fifth glass of wine, I'd have my third piece of cake or whatever it was. And then a friend of mine came who I hadn't seen in years and she opened the fridge and she said, oh my God, are you having a party tonight? So what are you talking about? She goes, there's this huge cake in here. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, I've been busted. And then she looked at me and she goes, are you eating that much sugar? And I and and, and you know, it, it, it was a shock. See, and this is why it's a shock. We pattern the subconscious mind as well as the physical mind to crave certain things, you know, to crave that feeling that we get with a dopamine rush, which can come from heroin or it can come from sugar or whatever it might be. We start to crave and crave and crave. And in that craving, we start to create a pattern in the subconscious mind that feels normal. And in the subconscious, if we do it for six months, a year, in my case, 30 years, it becomes very normal. You don't even think about it. Before you know it, you have a glass of wine in your hand and you go, oh my God, that's right. I wanted a glass of wine. It becomes so normal, even though it's abnormal, that we continue on that route. And the only way in our permanent addiction recovery program, we teach it, the only way to get out of it is to watch for every cross addiction. Once you get through, through your main addiction, whether it's a substance, a behavior, or we could be addicted to relationships. You know, there's, I mean, there's every addiction in the world. We could be addicted to negativity, to victimhood, to grief. We can be addicted to grief. We can be addicted to PTSD for God's sake. I mean, there isn't anything we can't be addicted to. And so yeah. in the subconscious, the way we change it is by going, oh, I'm starting to lean over towards, you know, drinking more coffee now. I want more caffeine to get that feeling in the brain. So then we pull it back and then we say, oh, I'm starting to watch more television and then we pull it back. So the brain is going to look when you're going through recovery, the brain is going to look for stimulation. The brain is going to look for something to give us a feeling, a mood, a shift a numbness. And so in order to move past that, we have to be on our toes. And like I wasn't, you know, 25, 30 years ago, when I got sober, I wasn't on my toes. And so I was consuming massive amounts of sugar. 
there's a lot of times, Dr. Leeds, people don't even recognize, you know, that they've cross addicted from alcohol to caffeine or nicotine or pot or, you know, and now with the medical marijuana dispensaries, and I'm not against them at all. Oh, my God, we've gotten a ton of people off of Ambien and some other drugs with some really great medical marijuana products. So I'm not against that at all. But if you're using that, as yeah. a cross addiction, because you've just let go of alcohol, heroin, nicotine, whatever, a sugar, whatever it might be, um, you know, then all we're doing is cross addiction. So if that worked for Grant, great, but it ain't going to work for many people, Dr. Leeds, because, yeah. you know, staying busy means we're submerging the issue. Let me repeat that. Filling your calendar says we are submerging the work. We're running away from the work. We're running away from one addiction to another. I think it's a ridiculous comment. I don't know Grant. I know his name. I've never met him or anything. And I, I you yeah. know, I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but you know, in the world of addiction recovery, uh, that's not what an expert would say to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, if work addiction gets somebody rich, you know, and he's a billionaire, then that's it's great for him if he's happy with that. But um, work addiction doesn't really work that way for most people. Um, no. No. And you know what we found, you know, there's there's a, a gentleman on Shark Tank uh, who was interviewed by The New York Times a number of years ago. And uh, they said to him, you know, you've made you know millions and millions of dollars. Um, and, and the reporter had a lot of strength and said to him, um, but what we've heard is that you have no relationship with your children. And he said, well, I gave my kids more than anyone else in the world could give them. And if that's not enough, that's too bad. They went on trips. They had all the material things in the world they could ever dream of. They've seen things that 99% of the world will never see. So I'm content with the fact that I wasn't there raising my kids. They got a, a life that no one else ever gets. You know, that type of attitude is so terrible because now you have another generation, his, his children, they'll probably follow dad's ridiculous advice. And you're going to have another generation of children that don't know what it's like to be emotionally loved. Yeah. That don't know what it's like to be emotionally connected. That don't know what it's like to have a dad. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a really good point. Um, it, it seems really difficult. You know, like you said, I mean, we pretty much have the, you know, the world, the world's against us. I mean, I don't know what, you know, what you think about politically as far as like businesses and, or, or with capitalism, but um, you know the social media is the same way. They've got the same. They're probably doing the same MRIs and saying, you know, this is a thing that lights up their brain. You know, the video game. I know for a fact the video game companies hire psychologists to be their uh, consultants to figure out yes. how can we make this more addicting. You know, it's it's like how you how they went from the coca leaf to cocaine to to crack. How can we refine this drug more and more and more to make it to give the the biggest hit for you yeah. know. To, to each person every time they do it and uh, you know like tobacco i mean people have chewed on tobacco leaves and then they had uh, cigars and whatever hand rolled cigarettes and now you have these things loaded with chemicals um i mean it's just it's crazy i mean but oh me, sorry there. um yeah sorry somebody was trying to call through and i, had to get I figured them. yeah <laughs> um but uh but yeah so i mean we basically have our entire you know not that i want to go communist or anything or uh, you know, or move to China or whatever, you know, I don't know if they're doing any better there, but, um, but it's like, how do we help people? How do you help people overcome an ad addiction when they have this huge, everything is against them? What do you do? You pick up your phone, there's social media, there's video games, there's the TV. It's like, what, what else is there? I mean, it seems like we're surrounded by addicting substances everywhere. Yeah, we are. And, you know, one of the things that we have all my clients, it doesn't matter why they're working with me, if it's relationships or finances, addiction, uh, weight loss, <clears throat> career, it doesn't matter. We have them all eventually get into the first 60 minutes of every day. And some people, Dr. Leeds, have to start with five or 10 minutes. They're so addicted to their electronics. But the goal is to have the first 60 minutes of every day electronic free. This is how I have all my clients. Now, it'll, like I said, it'll take some a while to get there. Listen, I have a, a young man in London, a client of mine who contacted me because he was totally addicted to his phone. He was addicted to the social media, video games, the whole nine yards. And we're talking, you know, 12 hours a day on his phone, you know, a, a minimal of 12 hours a day. And, you know, his life was falling apart. His relationship was falling apart. You know, his self-esteem and confidence sucked. And, um, and he had cross-addicted from heroin 
to video games and social media. So he thought he was doing the right thing. You know, he's off of the hard drug. He's he's now clean. Yeah. And all he did was cross addicted. And so when he contacted me and said, you know, I'm addicted to video games and social media 12 hours a day. Oh, my God. Well, we've worked together three months and he's down to an hour a day. And he is a totally different person, Dr. Leeds. He's a, a, a totally different person. So we say to people, number one. Practice and train yourself to be free of any social media, any electronic devices for the first 60 minutes of your wait. Give your brain that opportunity to connect with the gloriousness of this day. You know, I love Eckhart Tolle's work. Get in the now, stay in the present, breathe, meditate, write, journal, get a freaking book, get off your Kindle, get a book that, and I, I, a lot of people, Dr. Leeds, don't have never seen one. And this is what a book looks like. Okay, it has pages. There's, yeah. there's things in here. You know, right? It's like everyone is so used to everything electronic. And so we say, get off of that, get a book, hold it, sit in the morning sun, the sunrise, whatever it is, if you can be outside or have a window to look out if you're in the cold, you know, but we, we really want people to start to shift their identity. And, you know, you look at, at even television commercials, how many television commercials start off with someone asleep, their alarm goes off and the person reach over and the first thing they do is pick up their phone. Very oh, first yeah. thing. That's called yeah. an addiction. That's <laughs> called an addiction. <laughs> so we want people to get clean. So number one, that's one of the things that we said. Number two, and this is a huge one, is a radical change in our diet. I mean, radical change, you know, going back to real food. <laughs> I know people yeah. don't know what that's like. I wish I had some real food around me. I'd, I'd show a picture of it because people don't know what real food is. But, you know, real food isn't from a restaurant. Yeah. Sorry. It's not from a fast food joint. It's not from a convenience store. You know, real food is what you go and pick and prepare yourself. You know, restaurants are, are, are along the same lines as everyone else. You know, they know. What will make you come back for their fries? And I, one of the companies oh, yeah. has sugar in their French fries, right? So they have <laughs> salt and sugar and fat in their French fries. Perfect combination for addiction. But a lot of restaurants do the same thing with their meals. You know, they'll put certain spices in it to make you want more. Now, does this sound that I am anti-consumerism in a way? Yes, I am. Yeah. I really think we need to downsize. I think we need to get into a mindset of consuming less. And I'm talking less food, less jeans, less flip-flops, less purses. <laughs> I mean, everything, Dr. Leach. You know, I'm very much a minimalist. Yeah. I haven't watched the news since pre-COVID. I've never watched a conspiracy theory video. I have no idea what happened in January 6th in the White House, other than my clients coming in and saying that people crashed the White House. I do not pay attention to all of this nonsense. I do put my effort into helping this world heal. When there is a tragedy, we are one of the first ones on the scene. Uh, the, the Texas Massacre Elementary School about eight months ago or whatever it was, the Buffalo, New York racially instigated murder in the supermarket. We are there. My publicist, TJ Toriello, has me on the front lines with every tragedy. I don't give a crap about what's happening in most of the world. The only thing I care about is helping people. And the only way you can help people if, is if you're not caught in the machine. If you're caught in the machine of consumerism, if you're caught in the machine of keeping up with the Joneses, you cannot help people heal because you're part of the problem. So what I've had to do, and, and willfully, lovingly, joyfully, is remove myself from the world. I am an incredible extrovert in my work. I'm an incredible introvert the minute 7 p.m. hits. I, you will not see me. You will not see me at events unless I'm speaking, you know, and the reason I do that is that I know that I need my energy at the highest level possible to do the work that I'm doing. I can't fall victim to the fast food, the addictions. I can't fall victim to the conspiracy theories about the presidential campaigns. I, I don't want to have my brain with any of that crap. And there's a way, and I'm one of millions. I'm not the only one who's doing this. You know, there's millions of people that have just shut down 
the nonsense. And let's look at the media. And I'm part of the media. You know, I, I've hosted radio networks for 30 something years, television shows for 30 something years. I know the network like the back of my hand. They are there to make money. Yeah. And sensationalism sells ads. So when they can come and do a story that's highly sensationalistic, and then the next hour do the same story with a little bit different sound bites, and the next show do the same story with a little bit different an angle, you know, they keep people coming back for more. And the more sensationalism their news is, the more they can charge for advertising. You know, there's, I mean, you know, the greed runs the world pretty much. So, yeah. but yeah. guess what? If you're not watching the insanity and you're not talking about the insanity, <laughs> at some point you'll become sane, <laughs> which is the whole point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that definitely this you just gave <clears throat> some great advice, you know, not to get caught up in the news and, and not to have your phone next to you. I, I actually, I kind of accidentally gave up the phone addiction, at least at home, uh, not 100% everywhere. But uh, because when, when I walk in, I, I set up like the, I, I got I got this fancy charger at some point that charges my my phone and my watch. And I, 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 I use this double sided tape and I put it on a little table inside a closet by the front door. And um, then I found out there's no way to get the thing off. It's like permanently glued to this table. So um, when I walk in the house, I put my phone and my watch there. And, and I don't bring it in. It doesn't come in the house at all. Um, you know, people, you know, if you wonder how do I get messages, people either call my wife if they need me, uh, you know, or my phone goes to the computer. So I do go sit down at the computer periodically and check messages there. But yeah, I'm not, I don't have my phone in my hand or next to me on the couch or in the bed or anything like that. Uh, Dr. Lees, that is so powerful. <clears throat> I'm so glad you said that. You know, you have a lot of people that that love you, that believe in you, that follow you. And for you to come out and say that when I come home, my phone goes in a closet is absolutely <laughs> bliss to my ears. And it may not be to the listeners yet until they get into the mode of it. Now, I'll, I'll tell you something beautiful. And you may have found this. A year, a number of years ago, again, pre-COVID, you know, I would have my phone next to me on the couch all the time and looking at it and <clears throat> and then when COVID hit, it, I really made some major changes. And the very first thing I did, and this may help some people, is that I shut off every freaking notification. I never know if I got a text. I never know if I got a call. I never know if I got an email. I never know if I got anything until I opened the phone and looked. Yeah. So that decreases the dopamine hits because the phone is set up with those noises to make you go, oh, God, what was that? Who's that? What could it be? <laughs> Yeah. Again, it's set up by the companies to have us addicted. It's, it's you know, and, and it might sound like I'm some conspiracy theorist. I'm not. You know, this is how companies have done business since the beginning of time. If you remember the story of Coca-Cola, they had cocaine in the gosh darn stuff when it first was produced. They weren't stupid. They were brilliant yeah. marketers. What a great way to get people hooked on a product. And listen, everyone, every company in the world wants people hooked on them. Mercedes-Benz to Hyundai. Everyone wants you hooked on their product. That's business. But we have to be smarter consumers. So putting your phone in a closet is being a smart consumer. When your phone is not in your hand, you're less apt to consume media, social media, Amazon purchases, which we haven't talked about as a huge addiction, you know, yeah. whatever it might be, right? Like, so this is brilliant what you said. I hope all of your followers will take your advice and start to find a place. You know, we, we do this all the time, especially with, with individuals, well, between the age of 18 and 28, as we find most of our video addicts and video game addicts. And so we have them when they come home is that they have to lock it up. We've got them buying these little safes where they have to have a combination to get into it, you know, just so it's one more step to keep them from going back to the addiction. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's something I've told patients regarding um, something like heroin. You know, we have, we have a lot of patients who are addicted to heroin and, um, you know, they ask me, how long am I going to be on medical treatment for this? And, you know, I tell them, uh, usually the, the rule is at least a year, you know, that's a, a good time period. And, and I tell them one goal is just, for example, if you were to tell me, you have, you know, Dr. Lees, you have 24 hours to go buy some heroin. I, I, I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't even know where to get started. I wouldn't right. know who to ask or, you know, what do you do? Walk into a bar and say, can I have some heroin, please? I mean, I, I wouldn't <laughs> even know where to start with that. There's no, right. um, 
I, I don't know where the dealers are. I don't know who knows the dealers. Um, and I tell my patients that that's my goal for you to somewhere down the road, maybe a year from now, that even if the thought crosses your mind, because the thought will cross your mind and it'll be gone maybe in five, 10 minutes or whatever, but that you shouldn't even know where to get the stuff, even if you have a thought that you might want to go get it. You know, so yeah. putting, you know, that that's a, a good tool, putting uh, barriers between yourself and the things you're addicted to, like anything from putting the phone in a lockbox or a closet and making sure you don't know people that know people, which I know with alcohol and food is not easy because it's, it's yeah. in the stores, but, but yeah, putting barriers in between you and the thing that, that you have a thought about is helpful. Yes. Yeah. Now, do you use Suboxone with your heroin patients? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, it works well. It gets them back, back to work and back functioning yeah. quickly. Uh, the difficulty with it is getting them off of it because again, the manufacturer designed it um, where, you know, the, the lowest strength is two milligrams, which is too high to come off of. So, you know, patients that, you know, we have to work with what we have to help yeah. people taper when a year's over because yes. um, getting off the Suboxone, it's not, that it's addicting it's very there's a very strong physical dependence on it right. and um but it's definitely possible people do it and there's ways to do it um, oh yeah well you know what I, I love the fact that you have a, a year limit because so many physicians do not so many physicians just let their client well why because it's a money source right i mean if i can keep yeah. my clients coming back for more and more suboxone oh at least they're off heroin and i make yeah. money <laughs> well, they're I off heroin and I make money. But, you know, the other thing we that we've worked with a lot of doctors that are like you, thank God, that say we're going to put a six month year limit, whatever it is, and then they'll titrate down. And then when they get to that smallest denominator, they'll start doing every other day, then every three days, you know, and, yeah. and titrate down. And I'm sure you have some kind of method that you use as well. Um, yeah. But I love the fact that you put a timeline on that. Well, I, I should say it's not it's not a hard limit of a year, but everybody, you know, it's it's a year is good, but yeah, some people go, you know, I don't want to have my patients calling and say, hey, why am I still at a year and a half, two years? No, I mean, I mean, there are, so yeah, there are some people that benefit from longer periods of time, but the goal is definitely not to have them on it forever. Um, yeah. And the goal is also to when they're ready to taper and then taper lower and lower. And, and one, one thing that also works is to use a compound, uh, you know, the compound pharmacies that can make uh, sublingual dissolving uh, equivalents to Suboxone, buprenorphine, that you can, they can get down to like a 16th of a milligram. Um, and so they can taper to very small amounts. There's medication that can help the tapering process. There's a, a relatively new one called Lusamira, which helps with the uh, withdrawal symptoms as they get lower in strength. That's helpful. Um, you know, th so there's a, a lot of things that can help them, uh, you know, as they come off of it. But yeah, tapering is a goal. Getting off of it is a long-term goal. And, uh, you know, so, and, and that's, you know, th there's, um, tapering is kind of a bigger issue with a lot of different things. You know, there's people stuck on benzodiazepines that need to taper and, and they don't need to be rushed off by a detox that promises them a one week right. or a one month. They, they right. might need a year to taper or maybe even longer than a year. Right. Um, there's also alcohol, which is an interesting one. Alcohol, most people do, you know, the, the very traumatic and stressful, uh, very fast detox where they, they're taken off of alcohol suddenly there's actually something called the Sinclair method where they can taper people using naltrexone to take away the compulsion to keep drinking. And they can taper somebody off of alcohol over a period of weeks or months. Yeah, yeah. And you know that, God, you and I are so in alignment. You know, I, I do the same thing with food or any other addiction, you know, is that we set a plan. Now, there's, I, I do every once in a while, not often, but I do every once in a while get someone who just says, I'm going cold turkey. Now, if it's yeah. alcohol, I don't highly recommend it because you and I both know is that that's the one drug that you can die from withdrawal from. Um, yeah. And so we don't recommend cold turkey, depending on the amount of consumption of alcohol. We don't recommend that. But we've had other clients that have just gone cold. I just had a client go cold turkey off of meth. And, um, and, and that has been a very difficult struggle. But what he has found is that it's been two weeks now. He, he just went cold turkey two weeks ago and, and he was a regular user and he's found the psychological addiction is his hardest thing to battle right now. The triggers, uh, sight, yeah. sound, smells, seeing someone that he used to use with, you know, that type of thing. He sees so much psychological challenges and we're working almost five days a week now. Um, he's doing great. He's doing great. 
but he's one of the yeah. few people that just said, you know, I'm, I'm stopping tomorrow. And yeah. I think he's going to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. That, and those are, those stimulants are really difficult. And there's a doctor, Michael Miller, in I think in Indiana that he's doing some revolutionary work on, on medical uh, protocols. And it depends on, on what kind of a meth addict the person is. Um, and I know I shouldn't use the word addict, but, but um, you know, whether, whether they're, I, I think he has like, he divides them in two main categories. There, there's the, uh, um, the, the ones who are really tired and, 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 and sleepy. And, and then there's the, the kind of the really emotional, like he calls them ADD, you know, like, yeah. um, and they tend to get really angry and, you know, they have anger issues and they um, uh, short attention spans. And he, he uses some, some non-addicting ADD type medications for them. And, but he, and the other group gets a different kind of medication, but he says he has at least an 89% success rate in redu wow. significantly reducing cravings and keeping people off at least for enough time to get them into therapy. Um, well, so. and, and let's go there, you know, like a, a, a addiction recovery without therapy will never work because so much of addictions is based on trauma, uh, um, un unresolved wounds, uh, low self-confidence, low self-esteem, um, uh, sexual abuse. I mean, there's so much emotion behind addictions that there's got to be a combination uh, of people really getting into the, you know, we, we teach something called emotional regulation. I, I may have mentioned it earlier in the show, but, you know, it's one of the greatest tools in the world. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a phenomenal tool to keep people clean. You know, so there's so much that we have out there from an emotional perspective that has to meet with medicine, right? That, that I mean, the combination to remove the cravings, as you said, this researcher in Indiana is doing such a great job with is phenomenal. And then to enroll yeah. that person, because, you know, what we found in our work of 43 years, Dr. Leeds, is that when an addict or someone who has struggled with addiction for so long sees the origin, the emotional origin of why they've reached out, of what they're running from, what are they numbing, what do they not want to face, when they see where it started, like when I saw mine started actually at eight with sugar, mm -hmm. I found that when I was really angry, I'd go downstairs and my mom used to can um, jams, like strawberry jam. And I would eat half of a, of a fairly large bottle of it. And all of a sudden I was feeling great mm -hmm. and my anger was gone. And then, as I mentioned at 12, you know, it went, but when I found the origin and, it, and I, I had to work with a therapist. I couldn't do, do my own stuff, right? Yeah. She took me back, you know, and we looked at all these different experiences as a child that I had. No parent blaming at all. My parents were phenomenal. But, you know, my inability to express myself, my inability to, at that age, know how to use the words to tell them what I was feeling was non-existent. I, I, and yeah. so I would shut down, you know, and if I wasn't in, I mean, my, my, my saving grace over the years, even at, when I was in a heavy a, a addiction cycle was always sports. Uh, I played basketball in college and it was like the highlight of my life. Uh, but I was, I was an addict. I was an alcoholic, you know, in college playing basketball. So it's, it's amazing how we can pull these things off. And as I look back again, going back to the origin, it made logical sense. And when you can help someone who's struggling make logical sense of why they're in the situation they're in, it gives us a huge leg up for full-time permanent recovery. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's it. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, just one, one more thing. What do you think of, um, you know, we talked about therapy and, and coaching, uh, coaching and therapy are, are not exactly the same thing. And sometimes people might wonder, what's the difference? Do I need a therapist or, or a coach? And, and I think the main difference is therapy looks at, like you said, back at the past and trauma and coaching is what can we do about it going forward? You know, let, let's start where we are and, you know, come up with a success plan. Um, do you think people need both? Like, do they need a therapist and a coach? You know, I, I call myself a hybrid counselor because I, I do both counseling, therapy, and coaching, right? So I, I combine it all. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the world of therapy, it's kind of similar to 12-step. We have not <laughs> caught up with the times. You know, people yeah. are coming out and they're still doing the 50 or 55-minute sessions. Great job. See you next week. There still isn't enough accountability, uh, in my opinion, in the world of therapy. In my opinion, there's not enough therapists giving homework. 
giving assignments, holding them accountable. So to answer your question, what I really hope would happen, and, and we do this, you know, we train people to become um, mental health coaches, master life coaches, and there's a huge component of it that we teach them how to take someone back to find the origin of their obesity or whatever yeah. it might be, right? So if they go through my program, they're getting both because I know both, it's such a great question you asked, my God. I know both components are crucial. So I would love to be able to see either coaches become more comfortable with going into origin, family of origin work and all the stuff that we know is so crucial, right? I, I would love to see coaches be trained more like we train ours in that field. And I'd love to see therapists start to be trained more on accountability practices, homework, et cetera. As a matter of fact, you know, in our work, when I work one-on-one -on -one with someone, uh, we work together for an hour a week, a phone, Skype, Zoom, whatever works for people. And then they have access to me, Dr. Leeds, Monday through Friday via text from nine to five Eastern, because we take on a small amount of clients and I want them to feel that they are surrounded with support. So they have a question, they have a session on a Monday and on a Wednesday, they go, oh my God, you know, something came up. They just quickly text me and I tell them within 12 to 24 hours, they'll get a response to the text. And so now they feel like I'm really in their corner. They feel that high accountability. And we, when we switch to this model, I haven't done this for 43 years. We've only done this for the last couple of years where they have access to text me five days a week. It's been yeah. incredible. You know, it, it, it's really been amazing because sometimes it's something really simple. Um, I'm going to a networking event and I forgot what I, what you told me to do the other day. And I'll just text back, bring a sober accountability partner. That's it. Yeah. It can be a friend, you know, a buddy down the road. I don't care. They don't have to be, you know, part of your networking group, but bring some. So it's that kind of cool stuff, you know, that we can continue to help people move forward until I have them that next week for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine that there's, you really have, you can only handle like so many of like, you know, once I know once you get above a certain limit, maybe it's somewhere between 30 and 60 people or whatever it is for you personally at some point, you know, you don't want to lose track of who's who you want to like know each of those people individually. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, I have other therapists that are friends of mine that'll, that are way overbooked and they'll say that they'll go, Oh my God. You know, <laughs> I called her husband, Jerry, when and I've been working with her for six months and her husband's <laughs> name has been Mark, and, you know? And so, you yeah. know, there are things, if, if you do take on too much of a load, yes. And the other thing too, you know, let's be realistic. This is heavy work yeah. for a counselor, a coach, a doctor, a therapist. This is heavy work. You know, um, you look at the number of psychiatrists that struggle with addictions, the number of dentists that struggle with addictions. You know, there's certain fields in the world of healing that they're struggling because we take on so much of our client's stuff, even if we don't think we are, you know, even if we oh, think, yeah. you know, we, we, we take it on. Um, and, you know, I have to be honest with you, when I was early in my career, I started in 1980. Um, early in my career, when I was still heavily involved with alcohol um, and, and binging on cocaine, um, we had a huge load. I mean, a massive load. And then over the years, and, and, and it was great at that time, you know, I had outrageous energy. I, I was going through the roof with the love of my new career and all that was great. But then after a period of time, it came to burnout, you know, yeah. and I can tell you when it was 1989. It was nine years after I started and I was starting to feel like so overwhelmed, so exhausted um, because I didn't know how to not take it home. And then here's one of the most incredible benefits of recovery for me is that in recovery, I learned how to leave 95% in the office. Yeah, I wasn't able to do that when I was an active user, but when I recovered, I was able to do so many things that I couldn't do before. And it, it's been an, just an absolute blessing in every area of my life. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So uh, David Esso, let me ask you, how, how can people uh, get in touch with you? Uh, you did share your book. Is that book available everywhere on, on Amazon and uh, yeah, your website? Yeah. yeah. Helping Americans heal. You know, um, this book just went number one. Um, it has about 90 writings on everything from what to do with these crazy times with PTSD, addiction, relationship challenges, um, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. We have articles on everything in the book. So we call it the Bible 
of these challenging times. So yeah. the book is at Amazon. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, the website's really easy. Remember, talkdavid.com, talkdavid.com. You can go there. Uh, if you're interested, we offer everyone who's serious about healing a free 20-minute discovery call. You'll see it right on the website. Um, you yeah. can also get this book right now on Amazon for 99 cents. Uh, we have oh, wow. every month we run a special uh, of one of our books. We have 13 books out. And so this month, that book is 99 cents. You can go to my website and, and purchase it right from there. Um, don't go to Amazon directly to get the 99 cent deal. You won't get it. Go through our site and that'll take you to the correct link. And then if you want that discovery call, just go to talkdavid.com. You know, you know, Dr. Legion, you probably know this too. People think, well, what can happen in 20 minutes? You'd be amazed. Maybe yeah. it's an opportunity for you to vent and you're going to get off the call and go, oh my God, I'm so glad I was able to share that. Maybe there's going to be two or three things that you ask me. I might be able to give you, you know, an idea or two to get you moving in the right direction. So, you know, we love this work. It, it's, you know, I'm going to be doing this until I die. I have no intention of, of ever retiring. I, I, I think retirement is ridiculous, uh, quite frankly. I, and it's not that I'm a workaholic as much as I believe that we all have a purpose here. And the longer yeah. we can do that purpose, you know, the, the more people we can positively affect. So, and then at the, at the uh, website, talkdavid.com, you'll see our permanent uh, alcohol and addiction recovery program. We have a program of work-life balance for executives and entrepreneurs, um, relationship challenges, grief. Oh my gosh, Dr. Leeds, we have this massive program on grief that's out of control right now because of what everyone's going through. And something fascinating in a way, you know, I created a grief recovery program 30 years ago. In the last year and a half, both my mom and dad died. And um, I rewrote the entire program because until you go through it, you can do yeah. the best you can do, but you really don't know. And now that I've lost both mom and dad and, and it's been tough, there's no doubt about it. Um, my whole approach to grieving Dr. Leeds is so different. And, and so if someone is struggling with grief, you know, join our grief recovery program. And, and these are the main ones that we're working with right now. Um, you know, you taking the time that you have to allow me to be with you today. I have so much gratitude, Dr. Leeds. I, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people that host shows like you do that have no interest in updating our approach to addiction recovery. They have no interest in updating a uh, grief or anything else. So thank you so much for being a leader for being someone so open-minded uh, to bring someone like me on. I, I very much appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and David Essel, I really appreciate having you here today. And uh, I think you have an incredible message and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. We'll talk again. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find out how to stop the recording. There it is. <laughs>